Hey guys, welcome back to History Student Reacts. My name is Ethan, and today we're going to be reacting to the Roman Pomerium by Historia Civilis. Not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but anyway, I'm excited to get into it, so let's get started. According to legend, Rome was founded on a murder. Spooky. The dispute arose between two twin brothers, Romulus and Remus, when they led ah. an expedition to found a new city next to the Tiber River. The famous the founders agreed that the ideal location for this new city would be somewhere on this set of hills, but they couldn't exactly agree on where to begin construction. One brother, Romulus, was primarily interested in the military defense of the city, and therefore favored a centrally located hill called the Palatine. The other brother, Remus, was thinking of trade and commerce, and so favored a hill that enjoyed easy access to the river called the Aventine. You know, this, uh, his perhaps, probably, mythical founding of Rome I don't know exactly to what extent we know what is myth and what is true. Probably most of this is myth. Um, obviously, I'm somewhat familiar with this if you think about the name Rome, Romulus. Um, and you can see the different philosophies of the two brothers, one more focused on commerce and one more focused on the military. When you think about Rome and its culture, definitely more military focused, which sort of makes sense if you think about it in the context of this mythical founding. This disagreement set off a full-scale 10 out of 10 argument. Whoa. The group accompanying the brothers split right down the middle until there was a Palatine faction under Romulus and an Aventine faction under Remus. There was no possibility of reaching a consensus, so each side agreed to go to their preferred hill, make some <laughs> animal sacrifices, and await a sign from the gods. Some brotherly Remus conflict. And friends on the Aventine Hill soon saw six vultures flying overhead. The brothers claimed to be descended from Mars, god of war, and for mm. obvious reasons, the vulture was his bird. So this made a lot of sense. Clearly, this was the sign they were waiting for. Remus marched over and informed his brother that his hill had received a favorable sign from the gods. Romulus responded, saying that just now, 12 vultures had landed oh, on his hill. You got him. Remus was like, you're a damn liar, and insisted on seeing the vultures for himself. Remus was not satisfied by this. Sure, he argued, the gods had shown each brother a sign, but Remus's sign had appeared first, which must mean that the gods slightly favored his plan. <laughs> Romulus was not having this. He argued that 12 vultures was obviously... I will say this is a very typical sort of brother on brother conflict. Like my sign was first, yeah, but my sign was bigger. <laughs> you know, very very back and forth. It's you know it's kind of funny to think about. Better than six vultures, and besides, they had actually landed on his hill, which mm. must mean that that's where they were supposed to set down roots. The argument escalated until each brother gave up and went back to their own camp. Romulus was like to hell with this and began construction on the Palatine Hill. Job number one was digging a trench which would later serve as the base for the city's walls. Mm. When Remus saw this, he and his supporters marched right over to the Palatine Hill. They may have brought weapons. Uh oh. Remus and company angrily crossed Romulus's little trench and words were exchanged. Before too long, a fight broke out. When the dust settled, Remus was dead. According to tradition, Romulus struck the killing blow. Wow. Romulus would go on to build his city on the Palatine Hill, naming it Roma, or Rome, after himself. Humble. How much of this actually happened? Maybe some of it, maybe none of it, but the important thing yeah. is that later generations of Romans fully integrated this story into their own mythology. Mm. But this is all kind of tangentially related to what I really want to talk about today. It may seem like a minor detail, but that trench dug by Romulus would go on to become one of the cornerstones of the Roman legal system. That trench is known as the Pomerium. Oh. Pomerium. Definitely pronounced that wrong. The 
Latin word for city is urbe, or urbis, which itself is an offshoot of the word orbis, meaning circle. So why was the word city related to the word circle? In a legal sense, anything inside of a city's pomerium was the actual city, and anything outside the pomerium was something else. To be clear, most cities on the Italian peninsula would have had something resembling a pomerium, but for yeah. obvious reasons, Rome's was the most important by far. Over the centuries, Rome would grow beyond the Palatine Hill, and would go on to occupy all seven hills of Rome, and then some. A few early rulers tried to accommodate this by expanding the pomerium, but it was impossible to keep up with the city's growth. Eventually, reality set in, and people just accepted that in a legal sense, Rome's city limits were somewhere in the middle of a much larger, unofficial city. Mm. As this happened, the original walls of the Pomerium became less and less important, and over the centuries, they gradually faded away. Makes sense. The Pomerium eventually came to look like an open gap in between the buildings, with some ceremonial stone pillars to mark its place more or less an invisible line, well known to the locals, but easy for the untrained eye to miss. Entering the Pomerium was a highly ritualized experience, mm. all tied up in the law and in Roman religious belief. The hyper-legalistic Romans felt that it was important to invent a legal justification for Remus's murder by arguing that any breach in the Pomerium, including literally just walking across the invisible line, represented a symbolic breach in Rome's defenses. Yeah, very Roman way of looking at it. As Historius Villus says, very legalistic culture. So, of course, they would have to create some justification for their own founding myth, which was probably already made up. <laughs> Very particularly Roman thing to do. As such, crossing the Pomerium was a death penalty offense. Whoa. If this is true, how did people get into the Pomerium? If you want to get super technical, the Pomerium stopped and then started again at a series of designated gates. Ah. According to Roman religious thinking, these specific gates were extremely important, since they had been sanctioned by the gods way back in the time of Romulus. This fact became kind of absurd after the actual walls of the Pomerium faded away. Plutarch recounts the story of Pompey trying and failing to fit a group of elephants through <laughs> one of these designated gates, even though the land to either side of the gate was completely open. It never even occurred to anybody to take two steps to the left and walk across that invisible line. That's how seriously the Romans took the Pomerium. Gotta respect the ritual. In fact, in every meaningful sense, the Pomerium dominated political life. Mm. Rome's highest elected officials, namely consuls and praetors, were basically expected to carry out the day-to-day -day governance of Rome from within the Pomerium. You know, legislation, administration, court cases, religious rights, all that exciting stuff. Here, just as you would expect, elected officials were constrained by the laws of Rome, just like any other citizen. However, once consuls or preachers left the Pomerium, they were technically considered on military campaign, and mm. as such wielded absolute power over life and death. Therefore, you can think of the Pomerium as the invisible line that separated the military world from the civic world. This role switching of Rome's elected officials was embodied in the behavior of their lictors, which were groups of six or twelve bodyguards that followed consuls and praetors around for the duration of their term. Ah. Inside the pomerium, lictors carried a ceremonial bundle of sticks. Once they left the pomerium, they added an axe to the mix, which advertised to the world the consul or praetor's expanded powers. In fact, there was probably an elaborate religious ceremony each time an elected official crossed the Pomerium. Yeah, to my understanding, it was a pretty important uh, line in terms of crossing. I think Caesar uh, may have violated that or something along those lines. And I also believe the bundle of sticks with the axe on it, that's a, that's a fasci or a fasces. Um which is what the modern word fascist is based on. It was a symbol of 
you know, political power back then. And you can sort of see how, you know, modern movements claim that for themselves, you know, Mussolini. Um, so I believe that that is the root word for uh, the term fascist, was these fascies, bundle of sticks with the axe on them, symbol of power. But the details of this are lost to us. You would think that this whole thing would lead to an abuse of power, but it really didn't. The Senate was usually within the pomerium. Most government buildings were within the pomerium. Most rich people lived and worked within the pomerium. Plus, any decision was subject to a court challenge once they were out of office. In this context, the power available to consuls and praetors outside the pomerium was pretty useful in a crisis, but didn't factor into normal domestic politics very much. Mm. When it came to governors and generals, which the Romans called proconsuls and propraetors, the effect of the pomerium became even more pronounced. When proconsuls or propraetors crossed the pomerium, all of their legal command authority evaporated, instantly transforming them back into private citizens. Sometimes, for whatever reason, the Senate would need an active general to be present at one of their meetings, which presented a bit of a problem. Hmm. When this happened, the Senate would sometimes agree to make the trek out of the pomerium and hold an ad hoc meeting in some kind of public building, like a temple. This became a big issue in the late 50s BCE, during the lead-up to the Roman Civil War between Caesar and Pompey, right. at which time Pompey was technically an active general. This resulted in a remarkable amount of ping-ponging around <laughs> two different <laughs> temples and theaters outside the pomerium, yeah. which I'm sure was annoying to a bunch of grumpy old senators. Yeah, not very convenient uh, to work around. Another problem related to this was that in order to stand for office, people were required to enter the pomerium and declare their candidacy in person. If a prospective candidate was an active general, or even worse, an active general posted to the other side of the continent, their only option was to leave their post early and cross the pomerium, relinquishing their command. This tension between standing for election and retaining one's command should be familiar to anybody watching this. Again, going back to the Roman Civil War, one of the central questions leading up to it was what will happen to Caesar when he crosses the Pomerium? Here we go. When it became clear that the likeliest result of giving up his command would be banishment or death, he didn't, which resulted in a civil war. Ah. Uh, However, and yeah. here comes the dumbest sentence I've ever written, civil wars were the exception and not the rule. I should hope so. This same rule, stripping generals of their command when they crossed into the Pomerium, also applied to regular soldiers. Strictly speaking, there were not supposed to be soldiers on the Italian peninsula at all, but sometimes this was unavoidable, and in cases like this, it was useful for everybody to know that entering the Pomerium for any reason would mean the end of their military career. You know, it's really interesting the extent to which Rome tried to separate its civilian life from its military life, given that it was such a militarized uh, empire. You know, they did a lot of military conquest, massive army, very powerful, yet they really wanted a strict distinction between the military aspect and the civil aspect, which, as was mentioned, and as I mentioned earlier... Um, you know, was violated eventually. You have Caesar and then the ongoing emperors. In Historius Villa says they didn't even want soldiers on the Italian peninsula, which sort of gives you an insight into the changes over time where the military aspect gets further and further away from the Romans and then the Italians themselves, and troops start coming from, you know, Spain, Illyrium, Gaul, etc., etc., as the gap between the civic Italian life and the military, you know, life of the rest of the empire grows and grows and grows further apart. So it's definitely a very interesting sort of concept. Taken as a whole, this law basically made it impossible for any army to enter the Pomerium. Or, to put it another way, no individual crossing the Pomerium could claim to be acting on behalf of the Roman state. 
As we know, violating the pomerium was considered a symbolic attack on the city itself, whether mm. it came from a foreign invader or from a Roman soldier. Along these same lines, it may not surprise you to learn that weapons were forbidden within the pomerium. This was taken quite seriously when it came to swords, but it wasn't that unusual for people to show up with clubs and daggers during huh. riots or whatever, which I assume is just because those things are easier to hide. There were exceptions to this rule, though. During a national emergency, the Senate could appoint a dictator for a six-month term. Unlike every other Roman official, a dictator's decisions could not be vetoed. And more importantly for our purposes today, a dictator's command authority did not evaporate when they crossed the invisible line. Give mm. and you know, today, we think of a dictator as someone who seizes power and uses it indiscriminately, but... As was mentioned, dictator was a legal office that was appointed by the Senate. And in the Roman case, most examples of people being appointed as dictators end with them, you know, relinquishing the office as it was intended as. I think that's sort of hard for us to imagine today, but it was far more of a, you know, process uh, than just a sort of, you know, modern dictatorship giving them unchecked power to order soldiers into the pomerium. As a symbol of this power, a dictator's lictors were allowed to keep their axes and behave as if they were on military campaign at all times. Citizens knew what this meant, and it was a shocking sight to see. Mm. Obviously, the dictatorship was a dangerous tool, and so it was sparingly used throughout Rome's history. Yeah. A similar mechanism that was much more commonly used was the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, or the Final Act. Whoa. With the Final Act, the Senate empowered the consuls to defend the Republic by any means necessary. Oh my. Any means meant that they could ignore laws, including the laws of the Pomerium. This may seem like a subtle difference, but it's important in terms of the legal system. Under the dictatorship, Rome put the law in the hands of one individual, with absolutely no oversight. Under the final act, everything remained the same, but the consuls could ignore certain laws if they needed to, with the Senate providing oversight. Hmm. Although the results may have looked similar, the final act was much less disruptive to the Roman legal system. Yeah. The most famous usage of the final act came in 63 BCE, when the Senate empowered the consuls to put down a conspiracy to overthrow the government by any means necessary. The consul Cicero captured five of the conspirators, mm. and then, without a trial, condemned them to death and had them executed right there in the middle of the pomerium. Under the final act, Cicero was allowed to break the law like this, but the entire incident was highly offensive to the Roman people, and he paid a high political price for it. Yeah, that's a quite a major move from Cicero. Finally, let's talk about elections. This may be counterintuitive, but certain kinds of voting were actually forbidden within the pomerium. This rule had to do with the Assembly of the Centuries, the body that was responsible for empowering generals through the election of consuls and praetors. During these elections, citizens were divided into metaphorical military units, and these units voted together as a block. By now, it should be clear why this was a problem. We know that soldiers became private citizens when they crossed the pomerium, but how did that work for metaphorical soldiers? <laughs> it was unclear. What about the consuls overseeing the election? Holding an election with a bunch of metaphorical military units was a little bit like commanding one big metaphorical army, right? right. If so, was that allowed within the pomerium? Legally, this was one big gray area. In order to avoid these tough questions, on every election day, a big chunk of Rome's population stopped what they were doing and exited the Pomerium, making their way to the Campus Martius, or the Field of Mars, which was a relatively empty piece of land outside the Pomerium that was deliberately set aside for military activities, both real and metaphorical. 
Hmm. The only way to cross the pomerium was through one of the designated gates. And on election day, this turned a 20 minute walk into an all day ordeal. Right. Rich people could get around this by exiting the pomerium early and staying in one of their villas near the campus marshes. But good, for everybody for them. else, this was a real disincentive to vote. Right. So, broadly speaking, we can say that the pomerium was the legal mechanism that separated Rome's military from Rome's government. For centuries, this law kept the peace and <laughs> stopped ambitious generals from entering the city at the head of an army. That is, save for one enormous exception, the Roman triumph. Ah. All right, well, I'm excited to get into the Roman Triumph. I think the Pomerium, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, really tells you a lot about Rome. It tells you how legalistic they are. It shows you how important symbols were to them, how important tradition was, um, you know, how important rituals were. It really gives you an insight into Roman culture and society. Um, yeah, so that was a really interesting one. I'm excited for the Roman Triumph. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, please leave a like down below. Uh, I've got my history channel and my Patreon link down below, so please check those out. Uh, and I will see you guys again next time. Hope you have a good one, and goodbye.